to stand with me. I want us to have prayer together. And then I want us to look at the first six verses of this chapter. And uh, just pray that God will do a work in your heart and in the heart of the church uh, with these verses. They're, they're wonderful verses. And I want, you to, I want us to see together Paul's heart this morning and, let, and may God grant it to be our hearts, okay? Let's have a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to be in your house once again. We're, God, I, I think uh, that the church and the gathering of the church has been taken to grant for granted for so long because it's been uninterrupted. And, uh, and I think the, the real purpose of it has been lost in religion. The real purpose of it has been lost in tradition. But Father, I pray that we could see in our hearts what type of servants we ought to be in the church and because we are the church for your sake and for your glory. I pray that we would see that from 1 Thessalonians 2. Help us, Father, to look at these first six verses. Help them to change and mold our hearts, our wills, into your will. Uh, Lord, to, that your life uh, would shine through us as it shined through the Apostle Paul. Help us, and help us with your power, Lord, and in your power for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You be seated. Let's get right to it. And here's the question. For chapter number 2, verses 1 through 6. And really somewhat of the remainder of the verses of this chapter. But for this morning, in the first six verses. Uh, what is the purpose of the first six verses of chapter number 2? What is the purpose of the first six verses of 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2? Think about this right here. The Apostle Paul has went to Thessalonica, which is in a place called Macedonia. That's the region. He's went to Thessalonica, which is the city, and he has preached the gospel, and a church, a local church, has been established there. He has went through the dangers of crossing the Aegean Sea. He has been in danger uh, of, uh, of attack by thieves, uh, robbers and all kinds of different things just to get the gospel to the Thessalonians. He has experienced persecution while he was at Thessalonica. You say, how do you know? Because of Acts 17, verses 5 through 10. Those same people that were persecuting him in Thessalonica followed him down the road to Berea and you, and you see that in Acts chapter 17, picking up with verse number 11. And they persecute him there. And I'm trying to get Paul's mindset as I tell you what is going on in chapter number 2. Do you know what's going on? Some people have come into Thessalonica, and they have attacked the ministry and the character of the Apostle Paul. And Paul is having to respond to those attacks in chapter 2 of this book. Somebody said this about Paul having to do that. Therefore, as distasteful as it was to have to defend himself, he answered his detractors directly and concisely for the sake of the truth. When, you, when, when I read that, he says, as distasteful as it was for Paul is what he means. Paul didn't want to talk about himself. If, if anybody, anything is true about this present world, people will talk about themselves. They are, their focus is their self. But not Paul. His focus was Christ. His focus was the gospel. His focus was his ministry. His focus was to live his life for the glory of God and to have to break away from that, much like he had to do in 2 Corinthians and defend his apostleship. He has to defend it here because of detractors. But you say, who is he defending it to? This is what breaks my heart. 
He wasn't defending it to the unbelievers. He was defending it before the people whom he had brought the gospel to and they had believed it. He was having to explain his ministry and motive to people he had endangered his very life to get the gospel to. It breaks my heart. But that's just how it is. That's just how it is. That, but that's what these verses are about. These emissaries. These agents of Satan. Somebody said, hope to ruin the new church that Paul had just established by destroying its confidence in the person God had used to found it. Therefore, the person goes on to say, to say the opening statement of chapter 2 is a polemic, an argument in defense of Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians. But what I didn't see in many of these commentaries that I read uh, looking at this is the focus on this was to the Thessalonians who had believed Paul is writing this. Listen, listen to what somebody said. Enemies of the truth. Enemies of the truth this person is addressing. Who is that? Listen, that's the world. That's the world. And the truth has been gotten away from in the church because the truth is, uh, they have taken on the characteristics of the world. The enemy of the truth, the enemies of the truth, this person says, often try to destroy ministries of the gospel by persecution. But here's what this person says, and they're absolutely right. But when that does not work, as it did not with Paul. You couldn't beat this man out of the gospel ministry. They tried it. They stoned him, left him for dead. They couldn't beat him out of the ministry. They tried to undermine the people's trust in the spiritual leader's message. When they couldn't stop him by threatening his life, by beating him, by tracking him like a dog, they attacked his person. Will that stop him? No way. That's right. No way. What, what is he going to do? He's going to respond. So how does Paul defend his ministry and his integrity? Look at verse 1. Paul's ministry, he defends it by saying it was not a failure at Thessalonica. Think about this before we read this. There has been a great change take place at Thessalonica. And he emphasizes that his ministry was not a failure. Look at verse 1. For yourselves, talking to the Thessalonians, brethren, these believers, know our entrance in unto you. And he's, when he says entrance in unto you, he's meaning when he came there with the gospel, that it was not in vain. In other words, he says, my ministry there was not a failure. If you remember anything about our study in several messages of chapter number one, we saw that Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians when he came there with the gospel was not a failure. If you look back up at verse number five of chapter one, you will see that they believed the gospel. They heard the gospel. When you, when you look down at verse number 6, he talks about that of bringing assurance to him and, his, and the people with him that they were of the elect. But then when you look at verse number 6, he says that they suffered much affliction, but, but because, even in the midst of that, the verse says in verse 6 that they had the joy of the Holy Spirit about them. That they had, in verse number 8, Paul's ministry there had not been a failure, had not been in vain, because from there, had the gospel went out, everywhere that someone came through the port city of Thessalonica and then went to. Look at verse number 8. He says, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord. And, and the ministry of the gospel goes everywhere. Their devotion to idols had changed. Look at verse number 9. 
He says, For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. They have turned from idol worship to serve the God of creation, the God who sent his Son to die for their sins. They had a new hope, according to verse number 10. Had Paul's ministry been a failure, he was asking these believers to look and say, has my ministry been a failure there? And the answer, if they would have been honest and true, they would have to have said no. Amen. No, it was not. A minister could look at these verses and say, what do you hope to get from the ministry? If it's a godly ministry, what Paul's results are here in chapter 1. That's what a minister wants to see. Not so much sprawling spreads. If that needs to happen, God let it happen to happen. But these are the things they want to see. You know what, today, and I say this to everyone in here who's serving the Lord, and I say it to pastors who may watch this on YouTube or who listen to it on the website. Biblical ministers must remember their ministry is not a failure even if the, if the minister thinks it is. Paul several times thought his ministry was in vain. You read the book of Galatians. He thought it was wasted. But when a, when a minister, a person who's going to minister, does it biblically for the glory of God, that ministry is not a failure. That's right. No matter what the world would say about it. One of the worst things in the world is to have just a few people in the audience of a church. But I'll tell you, that's not the travesty. The travesty is to have heresy and untruth in the pulpit. Really? To have an uncommitted pastor in the pulpit. Yes. And have a person who cannot preach in a, in a way that the people could respond if they wanted to. Yeah. But here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. You take this. In your ministry, maybe you're sharing the gospel and not seeing souls saved. Everybody in here ought to be sharing the gospel that names the name of Christ. That's right. But here's what he's saying in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He said, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain. It may look in vain, but God says through the Apostle Paul that it is not. Number two, Paul's ministry did not stop. He wants to tell them, hey, my ministry had not stopped. You think about it. And here's why I think he says this. In, in, in the first century as well as the 21st century that we're living in, there's always been charlatans, heretics, false teachers, false spiritual leaders, whatever you want to call them. They are always has been, there always will be Satan's agents of untruth. Posing as ministers of light, but really are nothing but darkness. Right. Wolves in sheep clothing. There will always be those. And I'll tell you what I think exposes them. And what would have exposed them in Paul's day, and that's having to go through persecution. Do you think that Joel Osteen would take a beating to continue his message? No way. No way. If he can't have his fuzzy slippers on, he's not doing it. But not Paul. Not Paul. And Paul makes that plain in verse 2. Look at, verse, look at the verse with me. But even after the, we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. What's it mean to suffer and be shamefully entreated? One writer says, 
that these are strong words that show the intensity of the hatred against Paul preaching the gospel. He said, as ye know at Philippi, in other words, he suffered and was shamefully entreated at Philippi, which is another city in Macedonia. What happened in Philippi? I'm going to flip my Bible back to the book of Acts, and I would encourage you to do the same. But you go back to Acts chapter 16. I want you to read what happened to Paul at Philippi. And, and Paul is saying, and he's going to say in this verse in 1 Thessalonians, that my ministry went on despite it. But what happened at Philippi? We all, we all know the, the historical account of the Philippian jailer who was converted. But how did he get into that jail? How did Paul and Silas end up there? Well, this, this, these verses we're about to read tells us. And if you'll look with me at verses 16 through 24 of chapter 16, he'll tell us. It says, Acts 6, 16, 16. Acts 16, 16. And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which shew unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, the evil spirit that was in her, I command thee in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her as he came out the same hour. And when her master saw that the hope of their gains was gone, they, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers and brought them to the magistrates, saying, These men, being Jews, do exceedingly trouble our city and teach customs which are not lawful for us to receive, neither to observe, being Romans. And the multitude rose up together against them. Here's the persecution. <coughs> And the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep their safety, who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. That's the persecution that they received in another Macedonian city, Philippi. But did that stop the Apostle Paul? Did that stop his ministry? No. He's saying, I want you Thessalonians to understand that did not stop me. And that's what he picks up saying in this verse. Let's read verse 2 again. Uh, it says, but, 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 2, he says, but even after that we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, look what he says. We were bold in our God. You ought to underline that. The next time you are attacked to not share the gospel, as I was attacked this very week not to do it, you ought to underline that. And, and ask yourself, where does my boldness and power come from to share the gospel? I'm talking about sharing the gospel. Telling a person, helping a person come into the understanding that they're a sinner. And that Jesus Christ died on the cross, was buried and rose again. Helping them come to that realization through the word of God, you speaking it, and the Holy Spirit's conviction. You ought to underline that. We were bold in our God. If that's not an illustration of Acts chapter 1 verse 8, I don't know what is. What does Acts chapter 1 verse 8 say? It says, but ye, ye shall receive power. This is before the brand new ministry of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost that we talked about in here on Wednesday night. He says, but ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. For what purpose? To act like fools. In a, in a service, no, to go out and share the gospel. To share the gospel. He said, You shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. Do you know that this was the same power that rested upon a beaten and bruised Paul as he left 
uh, Philippi on his way to Macedonia to share the gospel. We will not share it until these words are firmly in our hearts that we were emboldened by the power of God to share the gospel. Yes. To share the gospel. We were bold in our God. This Somebody said this boldness to share the gospel comes from God himself. And is not something that Paul summoned on his own strength. I was in Walmart this week. Practicing my social distancing. Practicing my mask wearing. And a gentleman comes up to me and starts talking. And I honestly don't know everything he said. Do you know why? Because I immediately came under attack from Satan about the gospel. Because that was exactly the first thing that came to my mind. This guy's come up to me. He's opened the door. He's going to hear the gospel today. And immediately, I don't. I actually don't know exactly what all he said. I actually, and I gave him my number to contact me because I wasn't for sure what all he had said. But, I, but as soon as I started thinking about the gospel, I started thinking about reasons not to share it. Let me tell you something about the reasons not to share the gospel. There's never a good reason not to. That's right. And when I, I stood there and he was saying whatever he was saying, which is rude of me not to remember, but I just was how it was. I, I thought I'll not be able to sleep tonight if I don't tell this man the gospel. God help me to share the gospel with this man. And he may watch this message. My understanding, he looked like he was living with his girlfriend. But just like everybody else in this county, he's saved. Right? No matter how you live, no matter. No matter what your desires are, no matter. Which is unbiblical. But I did that. And I tell you, Lord willing, I'm going to continue to do that. Maybe he is just away from the Lord. Maybe this is just a sin he's not practicing, but a sin has just come on him. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, you will be attacked. And I'll tell you this, you say, well, you, you conquered it. No. That time I won. But the next time, I may not. You know what I mean by that? The next time, I may be such an attack that I decide not to do it and have to sleep with that. To have to lay down knowing that I did not share the gospel with a person who may or may not be going to spend eternity in hell. But I may have to lay down with that because we don't win all the battles, do we? We don't win them all. But I'll tell you what, if we put our focus on Christ, I believe we could. Yeah. If we would get this right here, we were bold in our God in our minds, I think we Amen. could. Amen. I think we could. But he says we were bold in our God. Look at the rest of verse 2. He said to speak unto you what? The gospel of God. What is the gospel of God? 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. That's the gospel. He was bold to speak unto you the gospel of God. But notice what it came with. With much contention. Much conflict. Did you know that it is conflict that keeps most people in this room from sharing the gospel? We are afraid that people are going to be Offended by the message. Can I tell you this? They will be. When you mention their sin, their being a sinner, when you mention their destination, if, if it gets that far, that is offensive. You cannot take the offense out of the cross. What happens though? A work of grace in that person. Yes. A convicting from God. John 16, of their, on them, of their sin, their, of the opening of their blinded eyes 
to understand that Christ took their sin and died on the cross for it. And then in humility, they trust Christ. That, that's, that's, it, it is offensive, but I'll tell you, it is the only liberation that we can truly have. Yeah. But we are afraid. We're going to be offensive toward people. So we've shut our mouths. And think about it this way. I have to ask myself a question. Would I rather be disobedient to God to not offend people? Or would I rather offend people in hopes that they'll come to Christ? I'm not talking about being a smart aleck. <coughs> I'm not talking about being a mean, old, crotchety Baptist. <laughs> I'm talking about loving people in such a way that you would risk your own life because you don't know what they got in their pocket when you tell them the gospel. Right. You don't know what they're going to do when you share. I don't know what's going to happen in there when I shared the gospel. This guy could have went off. You don't know what's going to happen. This world is in such darkness and in such, uh, well, as 1 John says, the whole world lies in wickedness. You don't know. But I'd rather, I can say it honestly, and I, I say this without pride, help me to do that. I may fail the very next test, but I would rather be obedient to God and take the chance of being offensive toward men. Because you're on one or two of those tracks. All of us. That's right. And we may swap sides of the road on that. That might be a two-lane road going the same direction. We get in either lane as we travel. Let's go on. Let's go on. What's the third thing? Paul's ministry was not self-seeking. Verse 3. I will tell you what I believe is hurting many pastoral works. His pastors are waiting for the next big thing. They're not trying to be faithful where they are. They're trying to use it as a step to get to the next thing. <clears throat> Whatever that looks like in their minds. But I want to tell you this. Paul's motive was people. Paul's motive was the glory of God. And he expresses this in verse 3. Look at it. He says, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanliness, nor in guile. In other words, it was not in error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. F. F. Bruce, the commentator, says this, so many wandering charlatans or false teachers made their way about the Greek world peddling their religious or philosophical nostrums. I didn't know what a nostrum was. And here's what a nostrum is before we go any farther. It is a, it is a medicine, especially one that is not considered a considered effective, prepared by an unqualified person. That's what a nostrum is. And that's what a uh, false teacher is. Why are they a nostrum? And why is what they're sharing that? Because they've not been called of God. They've not had the desire to, to serve and to be a uh, and, and really even given the gifts that God promises to give to those who he's going to give the ability of a speaking and pastoring to. They don't have it. Not like the Word of God gives it. But here's what he says. Made their way about the Greek world, these false teachers, peddling their religious or philosophical nostrums and living at the expense of their devotees that it was necessary for Paul and his friends to emphasize the purity of their motives and actions by contrast with these false teachers. Remember, he's being, he has been vilified. He is a 
to the people he's risked his life to go and share the gospel with. Now they are questioning his ministry and his motives. And he is saying, I did not come in exhortation with error or impurity or an attempt to deceive you. Paul is saying, I don't want what you've got. I want you to have what I've got. Amen. And it's the gospel. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. Fourth thing. Paul knew that to share the message of the gospel was a privilege from God. I love this verse. It was a privilege from God and the message of the gospel itself is a treasure to be guarded. You remember that. Verse 4 is one that's going to tell us this. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, you ought to underline that in your Bible. To be put in trust with the gospel, it's that valuable that God chooses those who will guard it. Do you know that you and I, as a church, as a pastor, we have had this treasure committed to us. It has been put under our guard to keep it what it's always been. Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Yes. Uh, Paul says, but as we were allowed God to be put in trust with the gospel, this allows us to see the high view of Paul through grace. Paul was a sinner like the rest of us, but through grace he became a guardian of the gospel. I love what Paul said of himself in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. He says, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and jurious. But I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. Does that sound like many ministering today? I do not believe so. Paul knew where he got all of his ability, his love, his grace, his message. But when a pastor or a person that's just right here, and we're just right here, we're going out here to share the gospel, when we think we can do it in our own power, our own minds, God uses those things, no doubt. But they're sanctified by grace. They have a proper view of how we got these things. Paul said in 1 Timothy again, and I thank Jesus Christ our Lord who hath enabled me. Nobody does the work, a true work for God, without the enabling power of God. That's right. No one. No one. So, how does Paul, if, if I had everybody in here raise their hand that thinks the gospel is a precious treasure, Probably all of us would raise our hands. How would you know that Paul believed this was a treasure, this gospel was a treasure? Look at, the, look at this verse again in chapter number 2. He says in chapter number 2 and verse number 4, he says, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, the gospel, even so we speak not as pleasing men but God, which tries, tries our hearts. And when you, when you look at this and think about about this verse, you ought to underline, even so we speak. How do you know that Paul loved this gospel? How do you know that he not thought it was a treasure? Because he would speak it. He would tell it to people. And that's what he does. He says, even so we speak. Paul had, a pure, Paul had pure motives. 
And he had a pure message. The gospel. Number five. Paul knew that the gospel was so precious and such a treasure that it could not be changed to please men. A book I read years ago said we took the blood of Christ and we turned it to Kool-Aid. But not Paul. Look at the rest of verse 4. He says, Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts, which speaks to motive. You can write out from that verse, motive. Paul here defends his ministry by defending his motive. Paul's ministry was not motivated by having been uh, having men be pleased with him or pleasing uh, men himself. Paul knew that the ultimate judge of our motives is God. One of these days, you and I are going to stand before the beam of seat. Our motives exposed 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 Corinthians 4. What was my motive? I'm not going to be in danger of hell or the fictitious place known as purgatory. I'm not going to be in danger of those things saved. But see my motives. Listen, you and I can discern whether a person is teaching truth or not. Because we have it. That's right. Right here. But you can't tell their motives. You just can't. You just can't. But every one of us in here that may think that gets us off the hook Look at the last part of verse 4. Which trieth our hearts. Who's that? Well, right before that is God. Right. God knows my motives. And that's enough for me to want to guard them. That's enough for every Christian to want to guard them. Let's go on. Let's go on. Number six, Paul knew that the gospel was so precious that he would not defile it by flattery or greed. He says, for neither at any time, verse five, use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness or greed. God is witness. He, is, he says to these Thessalonians, you can see it up here in verse five. He says, for neither at any time use we flattering words, as ye know. The Thessalonians knew it, he didn't. And he said, God is witness. Not only did they know that he had not used flattering words. You said, what does that look like? Turn on TV when you go home. You'll know exactly what it is. Paul did not approach the ministry that way. Which is a false way. He did not do that. But do you know that is what the church is warning today? Are we surprised by it? Not Bible students. Paul said in 2 Timothy 3, or 2 Timothy 4, verses 3 and 4, he says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. He goes on to say, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they'll say, tell me what I want to hear and just scratch it. <laughs> and they'll flock to that. But the thing that could truly help them, they won't have. Mm -hmm. And the misery will compile and compile and compile and the chase for, for happiness and and. The things they want will compile and their focus of themselves will grow and grow and grow. What's the answer? The gospel. Right. The gospel is the answer. Truth is the answer. He said, nor a cloak of covenants. Paul would not drape the glorious gospel in the rags of greed. He would not. And God is his witness, he says at the end of verse 5. We finally made it. Verse 7. 
where we're going to stop. Paul would not seek to flatter men, nor would he seek the glory of men for himself. Do you know why many of us compromise the truth? Because we like people's approval. That's true. Sure. You say, who, who probably struggles with that in this building? Probably everybody. Yeah. But, but because he was bold in his God, had the message of the truth, was cut, set apart to God. Here's what Paul says about that in verse 6. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, the people he was trying to win, the Thessalonians, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. As an apostle, Paul could have demanded something, but he did not do that. As a matter of fact, if we had a chance to go through verse 7, down to verse 7, he says, But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. He, he came to them not seeking their glory, not, not throttling them with his apostleship, do you know, I was, and I, I hope I got this right, but I was looking through all of Paul's letters. And do you know uh, two of the two of the four places that he didn't, uh, didn't name his apostleship were in Macedonia. If you look back to chapter 1 and verse 1, do you know what he doesn't mention? His apostleship. If you look to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1, he doesn't mention his apostleship. If you look back to the, the city of Philippi in the book of Philippians, the letter he wrote to them, chapter 1 verse 1, he doesn't mention it. There was something about what these false teachers were doing and how they were misappropriating authority. And we'll talk more about this next week because God has put people in leadership and in authority in every realm of life. But these people were misusing it and Paul took a different approach on it. We'll see it next week. I don't give next week's message away. You might not come back. <laughs> Let me ask you this. Where are you with the gospel? Alice is going to come and play. Where are you with the gospel. Where are you with the gospel? Have you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior? You say, do you realize how much of a sinner you are? Yes, God loves you. Yes, God sent His Son to die for you. But if you do not trust your son as your Savior, we, you will have to face him without having your sins forgiven. How do I get them forgiven? You trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. He died for you. He was buried for you. He arose again for you. Church, what are you doing with the gospel? Is it a treasure? Is it a treasure you want to give out? <coughs> you must answer to God and you alone for that. Stand with me.